before before we start, and I'm going I'm going to hand the mic around to our uh, speakers, but I want to tell you three things. First of all, yes, I am from the south. I'm from South Africa. And in South Africa at the moment, we have some major issues with um, with energy shortages, and they schedule blackouts in South Africa. They give you a heads up, and I get pictures from my family all the time of them, of their children doing homework by candlelight and by flashlight. And if we don't get our policies right here, um, we're going to be in that situation. The second thing I want to say is that we have had an incredible turnaround in this country. Just a few year, a short years ago uh, in Georgia, I remember we were trying to expand Elba Island so that we could get more liquid natural gas coming in from Trinidad. Today we're trying to get the federal government to allow us to export more thanks to fracking. And the third thing I want to say is that uh, a few weeks ago, the Environmental Protection Agency was in Atlanta doing field hearings on the Clean Power Plan. And it was a clear, clear indication of how the other side is, is willing to play the game. Um, there were sign-ups beforehand. You got five minutes to, 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 to speak and, and, and give your viewpoint. And I went and I represented the Georgia Public Policy Foundation. And when I got there, the entire schedule had been filled by environmental activists. Every five-minute segment had been filled. And none of them bothered to actually turn up. And that, in my in my opinion, was entirely deliberate to shut out any kind of other voices of reason out there. So when you, when you think that you know, the other side is playing fair, no, they're not. And so um, I'm going to hand the microphone around. We have some very talented speakers and experts here. And um, I, want, I want to pass it on so that you can hear their bios are in the, in the program. That's not what you want to hear. I want them to tell us what they do, how they do it, why they do it, and what their concerns are. And I'm going to start off with Tom Tanton right next to me. Thank you, Benita, and welcome all. Um, I am from California. I'm here to tell you how not to do it. <laughs> Benita uh, referred to South Africa's uh, rolling blackouts. Well, I'm from California, and we have them too. Sometimes they're scheduled and sometimes they're not. But I'm here to tell you they're entirely the result of bad public policy, not least of which is the Renewable Portfolio Standard, also not least of which is the Greenhouse Gas Emissions uh, Laws. Unfortunately, those laws are running counterproductive to their intent. Their intention is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions but because of leakage and the drive of manufacturing and productivity to other locations is actually resulting in an increase in greenhouse gas emissions. So if you leave here with one thing that you learned from me today, keep separate doing the right thing from doing the thing right. And with that, I'll, I'll pass it on, and um, I assume we'll get into more details later. Well, I'm uh, Betty Grandy. I'm with the Heartland Institute now. I spent uh, 18 years in the North Dakota legislature. Um, in that uh, time frame, I also spent a lot of time with what was what uh, many of you, and I see familiar faces, the ALEC organization. And um, at ALEC, I worked in the Energy um, Committee and Energy Environment and Agricultural Full Committee. And in my last couple of years there, I worked as the chair um, for the public sector and stuff. And so with that, um, I had built a, quite a relationship with Heartland. And so when I retired from the legislature, and for those of you still serving, there is life after the legislature. There is a recovery period that you will have to go through. Um, and uh, you can move on to many, many things. Um, but with that, um, I was... Uh, I'm hoping that I'm bringing my uh, background knowledge uh, of energy and environment issues to Heartland. And uh, with that, um, my focus is uh, North Dakota is known for energy. Um, with We have 
you know, we deal with a lot of coal, natural gas, oil. Uh, we have wind. We have some solar that's coming on. We've got hydro. The only thing we haven't managed to get yet is nuclear, and I still want a little baby nuclear plant just to say I have one in North Dakota. Um, so uh, with that, I, I, I believe in and uh, that we need this all of the above energy approach to things. And with that, what we have found um, in, in North Dakota and, and what we talk about at Heartland is the oppression of the federal government to this advancement and spread of the energy. It's a national security issue. And every day when you're on TV, uh, you listen to the TV and the news, it's all about national security. But security in your energy in the nation is a part of national security. And so I think we need to continue to look at all these federal regulations, whether it be in the electrical side with the CPP or the 111D, whichever terms you're used to using, or all of the different uh, rewrites um, for the BLM uh, regulations on orders three, four, five. If anybody's involved in any of it, you'll understand what I'm talking about there. The flaring, the uh, frac fluid uh, issues, um, they've came at the oil and gas industry from every single angle that you can imagine. They have attacked this administration with the EPA it, it, it's unbelievable. And when they haven't been able to stop everything with that, then they come with the ESA, the Endangered Species Acts, of which is a whole other avenue that they have taken on. So it's um, very interesting, and there are ways to push back. There are ways to address it. Um, and we can get into that type of thing um, later as we go. Thank you. I'm going to stand up if you guys don't mind. We both have colds, so we both have very deep voices today, so I apologize. Um, I'm Mike Hager, North Carolina House Majority Leader. Been in the General Assembly since my third term. I've been fighting the, one of the top two or three most liberal renewable energy policies in the United States and North Carolina. That may be strange to a lot of you guys because you think North Carolina is a conservative state. But what you don't know is so in 2010, the Republicans took control of both houses after what I call a 140 years of communist control. So that's what we've been dealing with. In 2007, we got the, one of the most liberal renewable energy portfolio standards in the United States. We actually uh, have a mandate to increase to 2021, 12.5% of our total energy has to become from the prescripted renewable energy uh, pieces, wind, solar, biomass, those things. It doesn't include nuclear, doesn't include hydro. That ought to make you pause a little bit. 80% of, of our property taxes for a solar farm are abated. They don't have to pay it. Somebody else absorbs that cost. We have a 35% tax credit that we finally got to sunset this year uh, after five years of fighting about it. More than the federal government has, you know, they have a 30% tax credit. Uh, in addition to that, our utilities commission decided to say, well, on qualifying facilities, we don't have to have a standard contract unless you're above, uh, below, I'm sorry, above 100 kilowatts. Or usually it's five megawatts. So that's one of the most liberal policies we have. So we, we have seen uh, an expansion, an explosion, I would say, of renewable facilities in North Carolina. We have spent since 2010 about $300 million on a tax credit. By the time the tax credit's over with, it's a 7% tax credit for five years. By the time it's over with, we'll have spent close to a billion dollars of taxpayer money. Our taxpayers have to fund additional. And, it's re and what happens with that tax credit is it can move to Bank of America and Duke Energy and all these other places and they can offset 50% of their total state tax burden using this tax credit. So it will cost us, when we get finished, about a billion dollars since 2010. The total cost is you'll never know because these policies are so inflationary. I use the example, <clears throat> there's three or four, uh, North, y'all raise your hand if you're North Carolina legislator here. I got two in the back, one here. I even have a senator here, but we, I'll speak slower for him. Uh, <clears throat> he used to be in the house, so I can give him a hard time about that. Um, we have a product made in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, in Forsyth County. It's called Texas Pete Hot Sauce. I use that as an example all the time. <clears throat> what a lot of folks don't realize is these portfolios are so inflationary to every product made in your state. If you take that example of Texas Pete, when they make that bottle, it has a reps rider on it for that, for that factory. But in addition, what a lot of folks don't realize 
is you have a, every city, county, and state building also has a rep rider. So that, that manufacturer's taxes are higher. So they get a double. Then it goes to a distributor. Their energy cost is higher and their tax is higher, so it gets hit again. Then it goes to a grocery store for the consumer to get it. It, get hit, it gets hit again because that grocery store, the energy bills are higher and their taxes are higher. So when people tell you that it's just a few cent on the power bill in North Carolina, it's not that. It's inflationary. It drives all products up. It makes our state uncompetitive with other states. And I apologize. I'm losing my voice a little bit. It's almost a reverse Robin Hood methodology. It hurts the poor more than it hurts anybody. Imagine the poorest folks in your districts and your, where you live. They have to pay more for their power bill, so a bigger part of their uh, income goes to paying their power bill. And they probably live in houses that are not as insulated as some of the other houses, so they pay more on their power bill. Then they go to the store and they pay more in, as their disposable income for the products they buy in the state they live in. So it disproportionately hurts those more. Now, we've been doing this since 2007, and I tell every renewable energy company that comes in my, in, my, in my office that if you've been on a government subsidy for eight years, you're not a business, you're a charity. And that's the way we're going to start handling it from now on. So you kind of know this is unfiltered. My, let my caucus uh, director down here is about to, uh, she's recording all this, so she's going to tell me what I shouldn't have said. So, but uh, I figure I'm out of state, so I should be able to say what I want, right? <laughs> so I look forward to the questions. Thank you. Um, I think the first question I want to pose is to Tom, because I know that you focus a lot on how technology can advance energy issues. Would you talk a little about that um, uh, to us, about uh, uh, what exactly it is that, um, y how you think technology can benefit the energy um, arena? I, th I, th <clears throat> I think the um, examples are far and wide. One of the issues of hydrofracturing in the West has been the issue of water. And while it pains me to say that uh, fracking a well takes less water than a golf course, uh, there are new technologies coming along to recycle the produced and frack water, reuse it. There are also technologies coming along to reduce or eliminate the use of water in fracking. <clears throat> extremely cold air pumped down the well will produce the same effect of breaking the rock apart. So if we can send down chilled air, we can reduce the water consumption. Now water consumption may not be as important in other areas. Uh, California is hopefully coming out of a five-year drought and the issue of water consumption will, will disappear. More importantly, energy is a critical infrastructure. And as other critical infrastructures like telecommunications and banking and finance and transportation and water delivery and water sanitation and everything else, uh, we often hear about the Internet of Things. Well, all of these infrastructures are intimately interconnected. They're all dependent on and dependent upon each of the other infrastructures. Imagine you get out here to Nashville Airport and the Internet goes down. Well, guess what? Nobody knows where the planes are, nobody knows where the passengers are, and all hell breaks loose. My firm is called T Squared and Associates, and many people tend to think it's uh, my initials. It's not. It's for trust in technology. We continually find new technologies. New technologies are developed primarily by free market entrepreneurs that break open opportunities for the U.S. and individual states to thrive and produce new opportunities. Hydrofracturing is a, is a perfect example. While it's been around for a long time, it was really the, the technology of horizontal drilling that brought it to the forefront. And either this year or next year, we're going to become the number one global producer of oil and natural gas. Well, that has a lot of implications in a geopolitical sense because we're no longer funding the so-called terrorists, we're no longer funding the, the, um, the hateful regimes in other places, we're funding ourselves. That has significant national security implications, um, but the, the technologies are just astounding. Back to the Internet of Things, it's sort of a two-edged sword. It's nice to know that my refrigerator can tell 
Westinghouse that it needs a new compressor or whatever without me having to intervene and, and avoid the husband syndrome. <laughs> but, it, but it also op opens up a risk. That refrigerator may be used as a hacking entry point. Reminds me of a, a little experiment we did back uh, about a decade and a half ago under a project I did with the Department of Defense looking at the vulnerabilities of electric grids. And we sent a, a gentleman with a then state-of-the-art cell phone, which by today's standards is archaic, and he was able to hack into the New York State independent system operator. And had he been nefarious, could have shut down not only New York, but most of the eastern interconnection. So we need to look at security from two perspectives. One is the good side and one is the bad side. But the technologies are, are just amazing what, what their capabilities are. But they never lose sight of the third wear. And the third wear combines with hardware and software and our own wetware. Trying to automate everything is just a fool's paradise. So uh, I hope that gives you a little bit of a 30,000 foot view. But inevitably, programs put in place by government impede technological innovation. They do not encourage technological innovation. Thank you. And I'm going to Betty on that great note. That's a great segue because my next question to you was, could you prioritize the um, the federal regulations that impede us at the state and technological level? Well, I think the one we hear the most about and everybody is uh, very aware of is, is the Clean Power Plan that is trying to be uh, implemented at this point. And it has um, all but about six states very much so in, up in arms. Um, it is continuously causing uh, multiple lawsuits over this. And one of the things that uh, it, it, what is not understood, I think, on the, on the micro level is that when you compare the amount of gigawatts that have to come offline with these coal plants that will eventually have to be shut down if this comes into full implementation, there will be 60 million homes that will be in this black out, brown out area, and we're talking about homes with elderly in it that will no longer have that necessary power for cooling and heating and just keeping food um, at a safe temperature. The bare necessities. And this is what is getting shut down, and it's shut down at a rate that as much as they uh, claim that they want to ramp up renewables, it is impossible to maintain at that level to get to that. You can't even put enough wind towers. You could fill the state of Texas with wind towers and not be able to do it. Plus, it is not a sustainable thing in that if it's too hot, if it's too cold, if it's w too windy, if it's not windy enough, you don't have the wind power. The same with solar. If you're going to tell me that in North Dakota, in December, during a blizzard, I'm going to stay warm off my solar panels, you have no idea what you're talking about. And I see my North Dakota, South Dakota people are there chuckling because they understand what I'm saying. North Dakota went through a lawsuit with Minnesota on this. Minnesota tried to force renewables onto the grid. And we won that lawsuit because of the mandates that they were trying to force on this, uh, on the, for this issue. And, and when you get to that point, um, Wyoming is having this same type of issue um, in their power stuff. And, and with that, I mean, understanding, you know what, maybe we shut off our dirty coal, as they call it, at the border, and let's see how long Minnesota wants to stick with renewables. And this is what has to be understood. And it is a state-by-state -state thing. That's, I think, one of the biggest problems we have with the federal government, is they think that they can come in and say, this policy goes well for everybody, 
That's what the problem is with all of the fracking type things. The way you frack in North Dakota is different than Montana, was different from Pennsylvania or Colorado. It's a different format. You have to know the geolo geological formations. You have to know exactly how it's working. Where are the water tables versus the oil tables? Where are the gas tables? And there's a lot more to it than just a carte blanche. This is how it has to be done thing. And the Washington aspect of one size fits all tends to be what the biggest problem is. Uh, so you talked about the clean, the clean plan. Yeah. What's, what's next as, as, as a federal um, mandate or, or a regulation coming down? Well, one of the things that we have currently been stopped in the court system, thankfully, um, is the waters of the U.S. issue, where they're trying to control all the water. So now they've, on the first one, they're trying to control all the air. Now they, then with this, they control all the water. And the other claim that they have going on is in those um, orders that are coming on, the, they call them the BLM um, because they're, they, they can really right now only kind of go after the federal lands and the tribal lands on the fracking and the oil and gas. But with those, the orders one, you know, three, four, and five, and those are all different lawsuits that, that have to come into place. They've tied up the states in lawsuits. I mean, this is just causing so much money in lawsuit across the nation um, with people trying, to, with, with the attorneys generals and governors trying to shut these uh, mandates down. But with them, in states like North Dakota, where we have um, the landowners and the mineral owners, and you can be both owners or they can be split, but what ends up happening with these new orders is this piece of land that's going to go and, and be fracked and you're going to take oil out of, that section where the way that we divide it to put these 16 different um, rigs on it, and I'm going real general, so if you know a lot more of it, you're going to go, well, that's not exactly how it works. But we're throwing those in, and they're going to come across like this, and they're going to shoot those horizontals in through this plot. Well, that might cross over, and this big portion might have a quarter of it that has a tribal or a BLM piece. Now you just shut down all of this because of this quarter, because the federal government has come in and caused all these different regulations that shoot through the whole process. They know what they're doing. Make no mistake about it. They have figured out ways to try shut all of these things down. The mapping on it is quite interesting. I, I think I have a, a copy of it in our, um, in our lawsuit um, that North Dakota put forward on this particular piece, and that's just one of the many. But that's how they're going after it in every direction, whether it's on the mineral side, the oil, um, I mean the air or the water. Now the water has been, um, it now has a stay in the court, but they'll come back and they'll do their rewrite and then they'll have to go through the whole lawsuit process again. We're hoping to be doing the same in the <coughs> states um, with the Clean Power Plan. All you legislators have been hearing about whether or not you're going to write a SIP. Do we do a SIP? Do we go to the FIP? Do we do a partial SIP, do we do all these different things, and your environmental commissioners or your public service commissioners are all having to deal with that. But in, at the end of the day, the more you comply with them, the more you're stuck with their compliance. And you have to, we, we as states um, and you as state legislators have to keep your hands on that and make sure that your um, regulators don't jump in with both feet on this clean power plan and then screw it all up all the way down because once you're in, you're stuck with these guys. Now, before I hand it over to Mike and ask him about some state level issues, would you speak a little about the sue and settle approach that's going on? Because I think that is very important for our legislators to hear about. Um, yeah, sue and settle is, is uh, they're the notorious way that the environmentalists get all of their work done. And so what they do is they wait for, and, and um, the Endangered Species Act really is one of those interesting ones. They come in with this stuff, and so they ask for, um, like, the sage grouse and say, we can't have anybody interrupting their land for all these acres across all these states. Well, okay, so when and why and how, and then you have to come back on the research. So they jump in with both feet all the way over here and understanding that maybe there have been a month out of the year that during 
a mating season that you shouldn't have had as much traffic through or something like that, but they don't do the study and then you can't get back through. So they, they leap in too far and then you try back them out. But the same would go um, with, you know, it's really kind of what the CPP is all about. They came in, they asked for input, the states give all their input, and then they came back with a whole other set of regs. And that set of regs, North Dakota, for example, and there were five main states that really got nailed this way. Initially on it, we were only affected by 11% of our power. By the time they rewrote them, we had 47% of our power affected. Totally changed the game in the last minute. And so we had to jump in with a whole second set of lawsuits and try to settle that out and sue and settle, sue and settle, and that's what we're having to go through this process. I, I think it's important to point out, particularly for you legislators, that there are certain groups that use the sue and settle approach to circumvent your authority. They sue and then settle, that court decision becomes law. Without your input, without your evaluation, without your assessment, without your concerns being addressed, they would prefer not to go to court. They would prefer to settle out of court. And they have a cabal with many of the regulators in the sue and settle approach. Betty referred to the case of North Dakota versus Minnesota that was decided ultimately in the federal district court favorably. Energy and Environmental Legal Institute also sued Colorado, the state of Colorado, on their renewable portfolio standard because it affects behavior in other states. Unfortunately, we lost at the federal district court, but the good news is when two district courts disagree, guess what? It goes to the Supreme Court. So we're currently filed for cert. We haven't yet received it, but we're quite optimistic. And the fundamental aspect of Colorado's renewable for portfolio standard is it imposes on other states how to generate electricity. And that is just simply not constitutional. So, Mike, if you will speak a little about how you in North Carolina are finding the best approach for states um, in messaging and, and, and in getting your voters to understand that, you know, while we want environmental uh, safeguards, um, this is not necessarily the road to it. Well, good question. Uh, that that the whole issue is very uh, technical, as you guys know, and and all your legislators struggle with whatever, it, whether it's Medicaid reform or whether it you know whatever issue it is, you have to educate your voters. And and I have to tell you know you guys a little bit about my background. I forgot. I'm a mechanical engineer, and I worked in in a, and I'm an environmentalist dream. I worked uh, running coal burning plants for 20 years, so they love to hear me talk about these things. I know every time I see an article about me. And it starts off that that Duke Energy Engineer is not going to be a very good article about me. So we kind of got that figured out. Um, so, so what we had to do initially, it's taken us five years to get where we are today, uh, to educate not just our constituents but, but our legislators in the General Assembly. Because as many of you legislators know, everybody comes with a certain set of education, certain set of philosophy, a certain set of values. And if you're not in the power industry, if you're not an engineer, if you're not of the technical nature, some of these things can be very hard to understand. Look, I don't understand Medicaid reform. It's, it's Greek to me. I admit that up front. But folks in that area understand it very well. So it's taken us really five years to get to the point where we, we've educated uh, our, our legislators. And I don't know whether they're just getting tired of hearing from me or, and they're just saying, okay, whatever, I'll vote with you. But, but we're at the point now to where we've got some synergy moving. And, and North Carolina is a state that got devastated by the recession. We had one of the highest unemployments in the United States. We had some of the highest poverty. My district was a great example of that. In 2010, when I filed for my first election, our unemployment rate was 19.2% in my county. Uh, poverty was high, as you guys know, it was old Texel Mill County. So, so what, you, what, what we did was ask folks, what's important to you? And we put green energy on there. You know, what it came back to saying is, listen, I want to be able to live. I want to be able to pay my mortgage. I want to be able to pay my power bill. I want to be able to take my family out to eat one time a week. I don't need my power bills going up. I don't need products on the shelves going up because I can't afford it. You know, our, our goal in North Carolina as a legislature is to, is to raise 
the economic opportunities for our families and to raise the educational opportunities up for our families. We can't do that if we're, if we're employing an inflationary strategy that if they do earn money, it pulls more out of their pocket. We can't do that. So that's kind of the way we looked at it. How do we heal the economy? And we employ things that heal the economy, and this renewable earned portfolio was actually taken away from the economy, not helping it. So I'm going to leave some time for you all to ask some questions. I know you all have um, uh, issues in your own states, and I'm opening the floor to anybody who has some questions for our panel. Are those your North Carolina legislators? I think this is going to work, so I'll try and speak into this little part of it. Thank you. Um, I'm not a legislator, but I am the director of a group called the Madison Coalition, which uh, believes that legislators are the key to solving this regulatory problem. And I'd be interested in the thoughts of the panel uh, on the strategy that has now been endorsed by 15 state legislative chambers, the General Counsel, the Republican National Committee, the American Farm Bureau, business leaders around the country for passing resolutions in state legislative chambers urging Congress to support the Regulation Freedom Amendment, which would require that Congress approve major new federal regulations. And the idea is just in the same way that states were able to persuade Congress to propose the Bill of Rights if two-thirds of the states say to Congress, here's what we want you to do, Congress is likely to do it uh, because they, they don't want the states doing it uh, themselves. I think that's a necessary but not sufficient uh, move. Um, Congress is kind of an unusual beast. They will listen to the state legislators, state legislation, but often go off on their own um, quest. I think it's important to keep in mind that legislation I itself is often a slow-moving process. And as ironic as, it, ironic as it seems, sometimes the best solution is in the courts. We do have a three-branch government with oversight and uh, cross-checks. Um, I think passing resolutions like that is an excellent idea. I don't want to take away from it, but I don't want to put all the eggs in that one basket. And, and besides, California can dominate anyway and foul up everything. You know, I agree with you, so, and I've been approached by that within the last couple of weeks, you know, the last couple of months, you know. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's the responsibility of the states to, I think their first answer when they have issues coming down like 111D and WARS US is just say no and see what happens. If we have enough states that just say no, and that was my first inclination when, when uh, our environmental folks brought, you know, started briefing me on 111D, I asked a question. I said, what if we just say no? They looked at me like I was crazy. They said, what do you mean you can't say no? I said, why not? Why can't we say no? Then they got into some other issues with nuclear plants and all that stuff, but we'll fix that issue. But, you know, the 111D is so anti-Tenth Amendment. It, you know, it intrudes on not only tell us, tells us how, you know, what we're going to do, but tells us how to do it. it. tells us what to do inside the fence of a lot of these places. That is, not, that is not constitutional. I don't see any way that's constitutional. So at some point, we've got, I think, a multi-pronged approach works. We've got to push the legislation you're talking about. And at some point, we've got to push back and get enough states pushing back and just saying no. Good morning. I'm Burt Jones from North Carolina. Uh, Mike Hager did not uh, tell me to ask a question. But uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit um, about, uh, about hydraulic fracturing and messaging. Um, you know, we do operate in a political environment, and I think those of us that uh, have really looked at the facts that are out there in the history, you know, have a pretty good understanding to some degree. Um, there's a lot of science there. But what about the typical, I'll say typical at times, voter that tends to look more at emotional arguments versus the facts that maybe not be very well informed or somewhat misinformed? Uh, how would you respond as far as a good way to message in a, I'm in a rural North Carolina district similar to Mike, uh, one that is pretty dramatically impacted by our decisions on hydraulic fracturing. And uh, we are being bombarded with a lot of emotional 
argument from the opposite side that is not necessarily grounded in fact, but people sometimes are not paying close enough attention to really look at the science and the history and the facts. So I guess I'm just asking you maybe for, for a little bit of good, simple messaging that you might recommend on the subject. Um, I, I do think that it's a, the economic ep opportunity message is incredible. Um, as a great supporter of your local casinos, I have driven that road and, and, and seen the poverty along the road to the casino, and yet there are those fracking signs, and people just don't see the, the, the you know, they don't see the connection. Uh, between the opportunity in fracking and the opportunity for jobs and 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 ad, uh, economic advancement in that area, so um, you know instead of instead of bombarding them, I think with the science of the of of the of, of the issue, I think you start speaking to them, you know, as as to how responsible it's it is being done and um, and how much economic opportunity there is in the area. I think I think it resonates, um, but let me pass that on. I, th I think there's a couple messages that can be used and they basically simplify the science to the general audience. One is hydrofracturing is not a technology in itself. It's coupled with horizontal drilling. And horizontal drilling replaces 30 or 40 or 50 well pads with one because you can reach out quite, quite expansively. The second is the United States hydrofracturing renaissance has allowed for the reduction in greenhouse gases 10 of the last 12 years. Because the production of natural gas, particularly in the power sector, our emissions are down compared to 2000, or excuse me, 1990. That's a tremendous environmental benefit in addition to the economic benefits. So I, I think if we message with the environmental benefits, it eliminates what is often used by the environmentalists. Well, it's the economy versus the environment. It's not. Hydrofracturing enables both. Well, I think, sorry, my voice is just really going to get worse and worse here. Um, uh, we are in North Dakota ran across a few of these issues, and uh, North Dakota Petroleum Council, um, backed with um, some other groups, started putting forth uh, more of that positive message you're talking about, talking about it in the um, environmental side of what 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 it looks like, um, spending time um, in advertisement on jobs, family, and economic growth, putting people back to work, putting. Um, it into that national security aspects of things. And I think that that positive message does start to resonate. Um, I think what's important um, a lot with what Tom said is the switch over from um, coal-fired manufacturing to the nat gas um, manufacturing has allowed for some areas of the United States to actually bring jobs back into those areas because of the steel and everything else that's needed for the oil and gas industry. So it becomes a cycle that comes through. So it benefits not just the areas where there is the nat gas or the crude, but in all aspects, and it's that secondary stuff that is very beneficial to the entire nation. And, and, and Representative Jones and I have had this discussion. You know, he comes from a very similar district than I, except for he, his district could be ground zero in our natural gas play. We don't have a big natural gas play, but it's high value as far as wet gas. So we could see some drilling here in the next little while. And I, th I think River Jones struggles the same way I do. I mean, he wants to, to develop the economic stability of his district, but he wants to keep it safe. And I think that's the key there. Uh, we've got to get the message out and better get the message out about how safe the, the process is now. You know, all, all someone has to say on TV is these uh, Republicans wanted to uh, dirty your water. 30-second message. But it takes another 10 minutes to explain why that's not true. And that's the problem we have. Uh, but I think the economic issues, making sure we drive those out in areas like you and I have, uh, Representative Jones, that will, how they will benefit, how it will make life better for everybody, how we're actually reducing greenhouse gases. I mean, it, on the sol it's the same thing on the solar side. You watch commercials for, I think it's NRG Solar, Home Solar. They show Las Vegas. And their point was, we light up the Las Vegas Strip, and they show it at night. 
And I had to pause for a minute and say, how in the world are they doing that? Uh, so I had, and that's just, that's what you have to counteract with the gas folks or with the solar folks or any of them. It's just misinformation. We just have to better about drilling it down to the basic facts, talking about the economic value, and talking about what, you know, the, the good quality of life issues. Uh, you know, everybody in this room has constituents that, that are legislators that say that, you know, 75 to 80% of your folks saying, yeah, green energy is a great thing. And then you look at the hierarchy of things on how important it is. Well, can I pay my mortgage this month? Well, that's pretty important. Can I pay my power bill? Can I pay my car payment? Can I take my kids out to eat this month? Are they going to a safe school? And somewhere down the wire, you get to, yeah, green energies are pretty good stuff. And I think that's really what we're talking about, drive the economic issues that are more their top ten issues. I think if every one of you take, go back to your utilities in your state and you ask them if you if you have a green, green energy surcharge, um, and you know most of the time the, the environmental activists have actually asked for that, and ask them exactly how many people are willing to actually pay that once it's offered. It's, there's, there's a huge, huge um, a disconnect there too. So um, these are the kinds of things that, that, that you can use as your message too that while environmental activists are perfectly willing to ask for these things, they don't support it once it's there. The same with, with, with the solar options. Um, once they find out exactly how much it costs, it, 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 it's suddenly not as attractive as, as it used to be. Let me ask, how many of you in the room are actually from coal states? Wow, you have an uphill battle, um, especially with jobs in the economy. Um, in your states. But anyway, back, back to the questions. I think there's another aspect. aspect to the question about messaging. Um, in addition to the cost of things like the renewable portfolio standard, what are they actually achieving? Are you getting any progress towards the goal for which they were adopted? And invariably, the answer is no. RPS is, is, a, is a classic example. What has benefited primarily from the RPS? Wind technologies. Well, wind technology, unfortunately, is intermittent and volatile, and it varies by a factor of eight over five-minute periods. What does that do to the other power plants on the grid? Well, it forces them into ramping to, to balance the grid. It's much like driving your car on a mountainous road behind a Winnebago. Uh, you lose all your efficiency when you operate that way, and as a result, these other power plants are burning more fuel, emitting more environmental pollutants, in, emitting more greenhouse gases than they would have without the wind. So why are we paying extra for the wind if it's not delivering any social goals? He's exactly right. Like I said, I ran power plants for 20 years. When you're ramping a power plant or it's sitting at the bottom trying to catch load for a solar or a wind farm, you're producing more pollutants per megawatt produced than you are if it, you just set it up on the top and let it go. Exactly right. I, I, and, and, and you talk about the message. The message is this. You talk about wind or especially solar because it takes up so much acreage. It's taken up in North Carolina a lot of our farmland already. You know, originally it was supposed to be put on marginal land. Now it's put on a lot of land that grows crops now, grows sweet potatoes. You know, North Carolina's number one or two producer of sweet potatoes. Well, we're taking up crops on that. And so I, had to, I went to California on a uh, seminar a couple, week, couple months ago, and on the way back I said, well, you know, let me take an example. Apple Data Centers in North Carolina, it's in Lenore, North Carolina, and they just built a, a 20 megawatt, 100 acre solar farm. So my point was, let's, let's assume, let's see how much, how many tons of CO2 will that, will that solar farm pull out of the air in its 20 year life? And I assumed it replaced a gas plant. No nuclear, which would have been zero, no coal, which would have been a So I took the middle road. And I figured out the cost per ton of CO2 removed for that 20 years. And it was about $150 a ton of CO2 removed for the 20-year time. Then I assumed that we planted white pines there, just planted trees. What would it come up with? You know, trees pull in CO2. Calculate the same thing over a 50-year life of a tree. It costs you about $4 a ton of CO2 removed. So you've got tree, trees or solar panels, and you actually get a better efficiency and a better cost by planting trees. Next question. question. Yeah. Hi, I'm Isaac Latterell, representative from South Dakota, and you guys had mentioned um, hydraulic fracturing, and my question was kind of more of a um, educational one, I guess, for myself and maybe others. 
Um, in Oklahoma, we've heard a lot about the earthquakes, but I think people most of the time pay probably less attention to the underlying details and the facts than even I do. And my concern was that there would be efforts to really start to more closely tie the earthquakes to the fracturing. And I was wondering if you've looked into that and how you would respond to such a news item or what's the real story with the correlation they've found in Oklahoma or the non-correlation? The important thing to keep in mind is the earthquake phenomenon in Oklahoma is not due to fracturing, it's due to reinjection. And there's two solutions to that. One is reduce the amount of reinjection, and two is be smarter about where you reinject. <clears throat> California is fortunate in knowing where all the seismic faults are. Oklahoma, without much uh, history of earthquakes, has mapped their seismic faults less so. Mapping seismic faults is not new science. Avoiding seismic faults is not new science. If you're going to re-inject, re-inject away from them, monitor it closely, and if something starts to um, reveal itself, stop re-injecting in that well. Reduce the amount, inject in smart places, and the problem goes away. You know, and, and uh, just, uh, just to add on to that, everything he said is just exactly what is, is correct. And the, what has recently happened in the last couple months is the oil producing states had gotten together for a conference discussing this issue directly and how will they come forward with their rules and how they want to move forward on things. That will be coming out very, very shortly from now. And I think you're going to see um, that positive thing coming forward saying that one, it's not fracking that causes this, but more importantly is how are we going to prevent it? And that's, they're taking that very proactive aspects of things. So the, or the regulators of each of those states have gotten together and they have set, they're setting forth a program on this. The other thing to keep in mind is uh, deep well injection of wastewater is not unique to hydrofracturing production of oil and gas. It's used in the chemical industry. It's used in a lot of other industries. It's used in a renewable industry called geothermal. We have an area um, near uh, Clear Lake in California that's uh, one of the oldest and largest geothermal development facilities, and they have earthquakes all the time, and it's due to reinjection of the geothermal fluid. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed covering uh, this issue in, in Georgia is how um, those who are in support of renewable energy especially like to couch it as a free, a, a free enterprise, a property rights, a free market approach to issues. But um, if, if you look closely, it's all about the subsidies and the credits. And, I, and, and, and that is very important to point out because while people are pushing um, from an environmental level, um, as I remember somebody saying about an eminent domain fight once, uh, uh, even when it's not about the money, it's about the money. So you should, you sh you should really um, uh, take a look at that very closely as you, as you examine legislation that does come to you. I know Florida has um, a push for, uh, for solar uh, coming, and it's basically, um, how shall I put it? It started in Georgia. Um, with 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 the Green Tea Party, and if you look if if, if you look at this so-called Green Tea Party, it's it's very questionable, and we've had our issues with the party. But um, are there any more questions? I mean, can I answer that? Yes. That, that's that's something that near dear to my heart. You know, I tell everybody they wonder why I'm against solar, and I'm not against solar. I'm against the way we put we we subsidize it. It's with the subsidization we have in North Carolina, a solar farm can be paid off in about six years. The taxpayer uh, presents about 65 to 70 percent of that burden and gets none of the profit at the end of the day. Uh, so, so if you don't think it's about the money, the way I finally convinced a lot of my caucus guys to, to really look at this different is I took two pictures. I did a, a GPS picture at the top of the two of the biggest solar uh, CEO uh, house. They live in $2 million plus houses while they're taking money away from folks in my district that make average $30,000 per family a year. And guess what? There's not a dang solar panel on either one of them's house. 
So what confidence they have in their product. And that's the thing. And they're spending, the solar industry in North Carolina is spending, when we're in session, about a quarter of a million dollars a month to pay lobbyists. There's about 30 lobbyists right now, basically working in the Senate. Uh, uh, thank, thankfully, they, we've already passed the bill out, and it's done in the House. We're waiting in the Senate. So if you don't think it's about the money, you're fooling yourself. And I'll give you one more example. There's a fellow in Charlotte, North Carolina, who's worth about $200 million. He's taken on the issue of wanting to be the global warming guy, and he's going to fix it for Republicans. I had a phone conversation with him yesterday, and I said, Je uh, I'm not going to say his name, but you'll, you may know him. Uh, I said, what's wrong with nuclear? I said, what's wrong with natural gas? What's wrong with hydro? He said, oh, those are fine. Those are fine. But I need you to quit saying bad stuff about solar. I need you to quit saying we spend $250,000 on lobbyists. I need you to quit saying it's a, at best a 17% availability factor in North Carolina. I need you to quit saying it's dispatchable. I said, listen, if you have trouble with the facts, you need a new technology. But I got to wondering, why is he willing to put all his eggs in one basket for a 17% availability? It's about the money, guys. That's what it's about. It's not about global warming. It's not about global crisis. What's the new thing? Climate change. I don't know what it's called now. I don't know what Al Gore's calling it now. But it's not about that. It's about follow the money. And they're taking it from your taxpayers and your rate payers, and they're making millions of dollars off of it. And that's what infuriates me. That's why I have such passion about it. Now, I will say one last thing, and I apologize. I'm a politician. I'm talking too much. There are places where they're doing it right. Google data center near my house decide to go to Duke Energy and say, we want to buy green energy. We want to pay for a solar farm. In North Carolina, you can't have third-party sales because we can't have a, you know, we have an incumbent utility. Uh, they're willing to pay more for their power coming out of that solar farm, and the ratepayer doesn't have to pay it, and the taxpayer doesn't have to pay it. That's the way to do it. I don't have a problem with that. I have a problem when you're taking money from my constituents, again, making an average of $30,000, $31,000 a year, and you're building $2 million houses outside of Charlotte on Lake Norman. I do have that problem. And it befuddles me why liberals and Democrats say they're for the working guy and they're allowing this to happen. I want to add a little bit about the topic that uh, Benita mentioned, and it goes to the issue of net metering. As legislators, one of your responsibilities is to make sure that your government adheres to its agreements. Many years ago, the government, in the form of the Public Service Commission or the legislature or whatever entered into contracts, compacts, call it what you will, but entered into agreements with the incumbent utilities. We will give you a exclusive monopoly on this area provided you do certain things, build power plants, build transmission lines, and we'll guarantee you recovery of that expense. The issue with net metering is to abrogate that contract. The issue of net metering says, I as a solar owner can make use of the grid, all the support services, all the other things for free. One of the major issues facing this country is the people's trust in government. Well, how much help are we giving the government's trust factor if we abrogate our agreements of the past? I'll just leave that with you. That is an excellent point. Thank you for making that. Um, we have a, a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to let you all have some closing thoughts, if that's all right. Oh, did you have? I'm sorry. Please. We have, we have two questions that we'll take. So all right. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to uh, stick to the clock. So just answer these quickly. If you can. All right, I'll try to be fast, and, and this may be more just something to think about. It. You guys may not have a response right now, but I guess yesterday AEP, American Electric Power, had made a very public statement saying they're pulling out of ALEC. Um, and the reason why they're doing so is they want to start working with the states to implement uh, EPA's clean power plan. And, you know, I, I, I think about that, and, you know, a lot of us, if you have AEP a, 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 in, your, in your state, you probably have contacts with people, and it seems like it's something that, that we should be able to have an effect on AEP to maybe change their, at least their public position, for them to take that and say that they're going to come out and, and support the clean power plan and, and push for states to do that. You know, I, I don't know if that's something we'd want to address and, and actually try to uh, push back on, and I think that's something Heartland may be able to take the lead on. It'd be harder for Alec to do that, I think. Especially when most of the states are, in fact, opposing um, the clean power plan legally. Thank you very much. And I'm a senator 
Janice Bowling from here in Tennessee, and we do have coal plants, and we have TVA. Uh, but the thing that concerns me most with the Clean Power Plan is all of this is predicated on a lie, just as you were talking to your friend yesterday and saying, but this, this, and this are facts, and he didn't want to talk about the facts. And uh, when, when the Clean Power Plan was coming out, I received a, a solicitation from a consulting group that wanted to help me to educate my constituents on how essential the elimination of carbon dioxide was since it's such a pollutant. And so I wrote them back and I said, well, I came from a public school many, many years ago in a universe far, far away. And, and in that school, the little poster board that they showed us that showed photosynthesis was so easy to understand. And God had created this wonderful balance of nature where carbon dioxide came uh, into the plants, then it went over and we took the oxygen that they gave out and then we gave them back. This room is full of CO2 right now, no doubt. And there's not a green plant in the room, so we're in trouble for sure. But I wrote them back and I said, when you can tell me when carbon dioxide, a, a product of respiration, an essential component of photosynthesis became a pollutant and under what circumstances, then I'll discuss how we can educate my constituents. Well, they sent back and they said, well, actually, the only time it's really danger, dangerous is when it's in a very tightly contained environment. And I said, yes, and that's why I've told my children never to put a plastic bag over your head and do not get in abandoned refrigerators because it's not the presence of carbon dioxide, it's the depletion of oxygen at that point. And, and so the whole thing is it's hard to even talk about it and act as though there's any substance to it. But instead, one of the things that I appreciate most from Heartland that I received, uh, I ordered over 100 of them and have passed them out at the Tennessee General Assembly, is the, the booklet by Dr. J. Lair on eliminating the EPA. And so we're talking about shooting at symptoms here, and I suggest that we as an organization or as a group look at his Committee of the 50 to go about destroying the foundation of this ending productive activity in America organization that, and, and I'll read for those that have never seen it, just one little paragraph very quickly. Beginning around 1981, liberal activist groups recognized EPA could be uh, used to advance their political agenda by regulating virtually all human activities regardless of their impact on the environment. Politicians recognized they could win votes by posing as protectors of the public health and wildlife. Industry saw a way to use regulations to handicap competitors or to help themselves to public subsidies, which we've talked about today. Since that time, since 1981, not a single environmental law or regulation has been passed that benefited either the environment or society. And EPA, the, the, pay, uh, the cost of the regulatory compliance is half of a $2 trillion regulatory um, cost to businesses in America. So just to, to speed this up, as we talk about these little components of all this absurdity, the, the monster, the 800-pound gorilla, is the EPA itself. And now we have the ability to create a committee of the 50 so that you have local control, local responsibility, local issues that need to be regulated at the local level. Um, and in Tennessee, I wrote a letter asking our state to join in the lawsuits against the Clean Power Plan. And we have not joined in yet. And I've been told because EPA cut a deal with TVA that they would give us some credits for our new nuclear um, reactor that's going on, Watts Bar 2. And I said, they asked me, don't you understand why we need to get those credits? And I said, only if I hold my nose and don't throw up. That is the most egregious reason of all to, to comply with something that we know is junk science at the possible exploitation of our neighbors by selling some of the units to them is deplorable. It's not what Tennessee's about. And, and I'm meeting with our Attorney General next week and our Environment Conservation Commissioner to, to say as much. But, um, but what can we do? How can we go about to really start the talk about eliminating a bogus rogue agency? Well, Reverend, Reverend Jones, I think this is the lady we need to come explain uh, all the stuff to our constituents. She puts it very well. Thank you for that. I mean, I like that 
issue, and, and that's really the, the detail we need to put it into, so I appreciate that. Let me answer a little question about AEP real quick also, because again, I'm 20-year Duke Energy, and AEP, like Duke Energy, are very smart people. They will not do anything that doesn't make them a profit or a bottom line, so don't get it wrong. I mean, I'll talk uh, the same thing about them as I do the environmentalists. They're in the business not to make electricity. They're in the business to make a profit for their shareholders. So their AEP is doing that for a reason. They're not doing it out of the kindness of their heart, I wouldn't suspect. Duke wouldn't do it out of the kindness of their heart. They're doing it because they see a niche there that they can fill, and, they, and, it, and it fulfills their portfolio in some way, and it, and it, and it helps their profits in some way. So, you know, I, I wanted to say that before we got out of there because I see that with Duke Energy also. And, you know, and I'm close with Duke, but, but I also see their warts and see everything else about them too. Um, I think your issue is one that we've got to elevate up. We as legislatures need to elevate that up to our senators and to our representatives to do that. And, you know, there's a little thing called election coming up here that we need to fix an issue in the, in the White House also to fix that. That'll help that issue greatly. <laughs> Well, I want to just uh, take a moment and thank you for coming to this event. Um, Heartland really appreciates um, your involvement in any way we can help you um, in any areas. As you go through the rest of the day, you're going to touch on a lot of other topics. Um, please uh, stay in touch with Heartland on that. And if you have uh, direct questions for me, certainly uh, you can reach me through Heartland also. Thanks. I have a hard time following this act. <clears throat> if I've left you with anything, keep the difference between doing the right thing and doing the thing right. Make sure that the goals behind any legislation are achieved. Kill the cronies. And equally important is abide by your agreements and recognize the importance of federalism in the issue just, just mentioned. Uh, the 50 states are a powerful block regardless of how uh, attention-paying the Congress might be. So I can tell you how important your state think tank is. If you want to find out who your st state think tank is and you don't know what it is, um, go to spn.org and you'll find the state think tank in, um, in, in your state. Um, the other thing is I consider Heartland to be the Associated Press for policy. They, uh, their, their publications are exceptional. They give you a great idea of what's going on around uh, the nation and how you can use that as, 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 as models, as examples in your own states. Um, as you said, there's a lot of carbon in the room. Let's not let the language of the other side, um, let's not incorporate it because it's not carbon pollution. It's going to be carbon emissions uh, from now until the cows come home with their methane. But um, the great thing about it is while, while there's carbon in the room, there's not as much hot air as there is elsewhere. And I appreciate you all for listening. And uh, our, our panel will be around, our experts will be around the rest of the day. And I want to thank you all so much for your input and your insight. Give us a hand, please.